Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you so much for bringing us all together tonight to talk about really important stuff and what's more important than what we put inside our bodies every day, three and four times a day, week after week, year in and year out. So um, can that possibly have an influence on our health? Absolutely. So as you know, we have many choices about what we put inside ourselves every day. And uh, as a society, we've been going in the wrong direction. We've been eating things that are actually harming our health. And that's why we see uh, all the obesity and the cardiovascular disease and the uh, autoimmune diseases uh, and, you know, like chronic fatigue and uh, how uh, we see time after time uh, the, the cancer rates just don't level off and uh, retract. They're, getting, they're, they're maintaining uh, and they're increasing in certain cancers. So we've got to start to look at our environment and our diet uh, because food is either uh, a healer or a harmer. And, um, and you all know this, but I'm going to show you uh, some, some proof behind this and um, hopefully uh, we'll all get uh, a little more conscientious about what we eat and because there's a payoff. The payoff is either great or disease. So I know which way you're interested in. So um, food is medicine. And that, of course, was uh, originally uh, spoken by Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, uh, even though it was 2,000 years ago. Uh, so Hi Hippocrates um, said, let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. And in a lot of what we eat, uh, there's wonderful medicine. And I'm going to show you uh, some of that. So, of course, uh, you know, the, the pharmaceutical companies, the drug companies, are really running health care in America. And uh, that's a problem uh, uh, because a lot of those medicines are harmful. Uh, so if you look at things like chemotherapy drugs uh, on the uh, toxicity list, all of those drugs are right at the very top. So why should we be uh, uh, using medicines that are supposed to help us but are highly toxic? It just doesn't make any sense, yet we buy into it as a society. But if you go back, all the way back to the Greek pharmacopoeia, um, everything came from plants. And if you look at something even as simple as aspirin, uh, it actually originates from salicylic acid. It's in the bark of trees, like the willow tree. And uh, the um, cin cinchona tree, that bark, uh, has a medicine that has been used to treat malaria. And foxglove um, is, uh, was used for, to create the drug digitalis. So the pharmaceutical companies have always been going to nature to find their source. I say we eliminate the middleman. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go right to the plants. So that is what's killing us, right? It's the flour products and the dairy products and the gluten and the sugar. And sugar is, you know, it's, it, there's, there's natural sugar and it's good stuff. But, you know, if, uh, if you have a body that has yeasts and molds and pathogens, they love the good sugar as much as they love the bad sugar. So we really, if we want to keep, and, and the cancer cells love the sugar. So if we want to keep our, ourselves healthy, we've got to keep the sugar intake low. And that includes from natural sources like fruits. And so these are the problems that we have here. If you look at that picture here, that's what the typical American diet, that's what they put in their stomach, right? That's an image of a stomach. And that's all the garbage we put in it. And if you look on the right-hand side, you can see 
what um, is actually happening to the intestinal tract uh, there, that's actually a porous wall in the intestine. This is a healthy wall, and that's a porous wall. And that uh, creates the leaky gut syndrome because nutrients penetrate the wall and enter the bloodstream before they're completely digested. And so the immune system finds these incomplete proteins in, their, uh, in the bloodstream, and it attacks them. And that's what's where, when our immune system is attacking our, our own bodies, that's what's called an autoimmune disease. And that leads to things like allergies and asthma and uh, chronic fatigue uh, syndrome and fibromyalgia and psoriasis, all of these problems. But if we think green, we're on the right track because the original food on the planet is the green plant. If you look at um, what feeds the planet, what feeds all animals, uh, it starts with sunlight, photosynthesis, that's the process whereby the action of sunshine wakes up and, and stimulates the chloroplast cells in green plants, and that action actually produces carbohydrates, uh, it produces carbon, and gives off oxygen. And oxygen, sort of like an air cleaner. So green plants are the original foundation, the original food in the planet. And the first green plant on the planet was grass. And you can find grass everywhere on the planet, even in the Arctic tundra, that grass, that little one-inch short Tundra grass is, is grass. So it's, it's on every continent, and uh, it is the original food that is manufactured by sunlight. So if we start to take a close look at this food, we can see all kinds of wonderful, amazing uh, things in it. Um, uh, you know, even just things like celery, we have research that shows it low, lowers blood pressure. And kale prevents cataracts and lowers cholesterol. And parsley prevents ulcers. And uh, lemon, lemon produces uh, limonene. And uh, that's a, a very powerful agent. It can break down gallstones and kidney stones. Um, uh, you know, you probably have some of it in under uh, your cabinet, under the sink where you keep your cleaning products. Uh, because those citrus-based cleaning products have this strong uh, cl uh, natural cleaner in it. And that's uh, what, what's the kind of cleaning we want on our insides as well, not just on the bathroom floor. So if you look at common foods like spinach, I mean, there's, there is research on all of this. Um, um, a colon cancer, Alzheimer's disease, there's research on all of this and uh, cilantro, otherwise known as coriander, um, great for things like bad breath, and uh, increases the good cholesterol, decreases the bad cholesterol, chelates out metals. This is all university peer-reviewed research, and this is in the food that we could be eating every single day. Grapes, polyphenols, resveratrol, uh, isothiocyanates, reduces blood clotting, uh, Alzheimer's research. Um, this is great stuff, and it's just in natural food. You don't have to go to a pharmacy to get it. The only pharmacy you need is the pharmacy that starts with an F. That's the pharmacy that we need. <laughs> so, and of course, uh, you know, I like to put all of this into my juicer and into my blender. Uh, when you juice, you concentrate everything, and we can really get medicinal levels uh, out of it. So this is a busy blender uh, over here. So making these green smoothies is a great thing to do. And Wigmore um, uh, used to call them energy soup. And uh, energy soup is essentially just a, you know, a vegetable uh, smoothie, and there's a lot of different uh, versions uh, of it. Um, I also put dulse in mine. I'm a big fan of dulse. Stephen mentioned earlier about the sea vegetables, um, really important. 
Um, and this is my juicer. Uh, that's kale. That's the Russian kale, the lacinato kale. Um, and, um, you, know, you know, it does make a mess. But I always say, you can't make a mess when you're working with clean food. So, great stuff here. And of course, if you're uh, not ready to uh, drink it right away, you're on the run, put it in a thermos, chill it first, put it in a chilled thermos, and you're on your way. So, that's your pharmacy right here. That goes in there, the best medicine. And uh, I've measured this. Uh, I put in one pound of carrots, and I got eight ounces of carrot juice. Now, has anybody ever tried to eat and digest a pound of carrots? Do you, do you even think it's possible? You would have such a stomach ache, and there's just no way you could get through it. But eight ounces of carrot juice? Seconds. And here's the other thing. Not only can you drink it so easily, but it goes right past your stomach. It doesn't need to spend any time in the stomach. It's a water extract. It goes right to the, the beginning of the small intestine, the duodenum, and it um, filtrates right through and goes right into your bloodstream. The only thing that gets into your bloodstream faster than juice, anybody want to guess? Oxygen. Oxygen. Exactly. Very smart. So, <laughs> so, um, so, wow, this is instant energy, and what if you have a weak digestive system? No problem, because there's no digestion involved. We're not secreting digestive enzymes in the stomach or the pancreas for this. This is a water extract. So, first of all, we have the nutrition of a pound of carrots concentrated in a glass of juice, and that glass, because it's a water extract, goes right into your bloodstream. So you're getting as close to 100% nourishment as is possible. Because as you know, is there anyone here with 100% perfect digestion? We don't have perfect digestion. What we eat, even the best organic food, doesn't always make it 100% into our bloodstream. Because that is, of course... What the purpose of food is nourishment. We're trying to feed our tissues and our glands and our cells. And so we want to deliver that nutrition to those tissues. But um, the digestive system is, has its imperfections. None of us has a liver that performs with 100% efficiency. So we don't get 100% of all that good, expensive, organic food that we're eating. But with juice, you're getting as close to 100% absorption and assimilation as you can, possibly can. So, and the concentration, the concentration in here means that the nutrition in the carrots is concentrated. Because, you know, I mentioned before about aspirin and about... Um, the salicylic acid in aspirin. Well, you could go to the willow tree and m chew on the bark for an hour, and it probably won't cure your headache. But you could take one aspirin, and it'll probably cure your headache, right? So the difference is that one is highly concentrated, and the other is in its natural form. So when you concentrate the nutrition in vegetables with your juicer machine, you are now bringing it up to a therapeutic dosage. And that's what will, will heal you. Because you can eat all the broccoli that you could possibly stomach, but it's probably not enough to give you the glucosinolates that would be required to, to stop the growth of cancer cells. But if you juice it, well, now we're talking about therapeutic dosage. Now we can actually heal using that. So the sprouts, what makes the sprouts so great is as baby plants, they are essentially concentrated. They are naturally concentrates. So in general, sprouts have between 50 and 100 times more 
nutrition than their um, mature counterparts. So um, the science that was done uh, on broccoli, for example, discovered that the glucosinolates I mentioned before can uh, actually sit on the alpha receptors of a tumor and block it. So it actually, uh, it, the glucosinolates convert to another enzyme called sulforaphane in our digestion, and that blocks the, uh, the alpha receptors on the cancer cell. So we're starving cancer, but the studies found that the broccoli sprouts, only five and six days old, have 50 to 100 times more glucosinolate content than mature organic broccoli, even if you grow it in your backyard. So now we're talking medicine. And that's where the, the term functional food comes from. So we have over here, buck, um, um, this is pea shoots, um, this is uh, buckwheat, uh, that looks uh, like cabbage, and uh, that over there is broccoli. And that's sunflower on the top over there. So this is the kind of thing you can have in your kitchen all winter long. This is, you know, winter time in my house, all the greens growing. You know, when, when summer is here and you can grow the greens in the backyard, great. But what if you don't have a backyard? What if you live in New York City and you have an apartment? And how many of you live in an apartment building? Okay. Are you, how many of you are growing green plants in your apartments? So a lot of people grow plants, right? But the kind of plants that I grow in my apartment, I can eat. And that's the difference. If you're going to put that effort into gardening in your apartment just for the greenery, why not do it for the nourishment as well? <clears throat> so before the uh, modern era of sprouting, which was popularized by Ann Wigmore and Victoris Kolvinskis out of Boston at the Hippocrates Health Institute, before they came along, um, uh, the Asians dominated the sprouting world. And for them, it was beans with a tail on it. So we'd have a lot of mung beans and soybeans uh, sprouts. And that's what you see uh, over here. It's uh, peas with a tail on it. And that's all fine and good. Um, but uh, for me, I'm really interested in the green leafy stuff. Um, but if you want to do um, the beans with a tail on it, um, I developed this sprout bag as an alternative to the jar many years ago um, because it breathes unlike a jar and it drains unlike a jar perfectly on all sides. So no mold because we have air circulation, we have drainage, we don't, we're not promoting the environment that mold and mildew likes to grow in. So um, these things work very nicely. You just dip them and hang them. It works like a, like a if you can use a tea bag, you can use a sprout bag. <laughs> and some things you can grow. That's uh, chickpeas over there. And uh, you can make a nice hummus uh, out of it. Uh, just grind it up. Once you, once you grow them, um, once you grow these beans, they're edible in the raw state. You see, and that's something uh, that is actually miraculous because there is no culture on the planet that consumes beans in the raw state, right? Everybody cooks the beans because they're like eating pebbles otherwise, right? So we have to either cook them or you can germinate them. If you germinate them, they're edible, edible in the raw state. And this is um, kamut. And when you grind the camut up and make a, uh, a um, it's sort of like a dough out of it when you grind it up, then you can make things with the dough. I, I made breadsticks here. Uh, I rolled them in seeds. Uh, but it's just the ground up sprouts. So lots of things that you can do when you're growing uh, this kind of stuff. And uh, there's a picture of my book with recipes for this kind of bread, which is basically ground up 
sprouts. So there's actually no flower in this product. There's just sprouts. But, um, uh, but they're living sprouts. And uh, these, this can be made in an oven at a low temperature, so very slowly. Uh, but that would still take about three hours or more. Um, and if you flatten it out, then you can put it in a dehydrator at 118 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the maximum you want to, you know, so that you're not killing enzymes. And that flatbread, well, that'll take about eight hours or more uh, to dehydrate. But that's the only way you can eat grain. We don't eat grain in the raw state unless we germinate it or cook it. So um, the sprout bag is a wonderful way to also grow greens. It takes a little more technique to do this because you have to roll back the collar and give them light and stand them straight up in order for them to grow straight up. Um, so, um, so even though the sprout bag is designed more for grains and beans, it can grow some greens as well if you pull back the collar. And uh, here's an example of arugula, which is grown actually on the surface of a sprout bag. Arugula belongs to um, a group of seeds that are gelatinous, which means they form a mucilage, and they need to be smeared on a porous surface. So you all know about the chia pet and clay uh, sprouters. They're, they are meant for things like arugula and chia, uh, and uh, psyllium and flaxseed, you can grow all of those. They're all gelatinous seeds. Gelatinous seeds are harder to grow, but you would need a porous surface to do them. I don't recommend you do it as the first thing you sprout if you're new to this, but I do uh, recommend you enjoy it because this is absolutely delicious. If you love arugula, you'll love it in the baby form. <clears throat> So this is um, an example of uh, my favorite uh, sprouter. I had something to do uh, with the, uh, I, the, the change of the old design to the new design. I didn't really invent it per se, but I perfected it. Uh, and uh, it's uh, manufactured by a company in California. It's called the Fresh Life. And this is two growing levels, and this is one growing level. In the bottom is uh, a water reservoir. Uh, that feeds the uh, sprouts. Um, there's another version uh, that doesn't have a water reservoir, so if you want it to be uh, shorter, um, it still takes up the same uh, space, which is 11 inches in diameter, some right in front of me here. Uh, but even though it takes up 11 inches in diameter, this is now shorter because there's no water reservoir. So this requires that you water it by hand, and uh, there is um, a tray at the bottom, and that tray is where you lay your seeds. In this case, I was able to uh, sow four compatible seeds. What makes them compatible is they grow approximately at the same rate, and they finish approximately at the same height. So if you look at my sprout chart or if you read the instruction book, that it gives you some guidelines on which ones are compatible. Um, but first time out, it's good to start with just one thing because, as you can imagine, it's simpler. And this is, uh, when, you, when you pull that tray out, this is what it looks like. And then you just pluck it with your fingers and harvest it. This is what, when you're using the uh, water reservoir. That's how um, it looks to, uh, to water itself. And there it is watering. That's sunflower being watered. And over here, this is garlic chives. I'm a big fan of garlic chives. It's one of the longest, um, has one of the longest maturity dates it's about 14 days, and that's alfalfa in the uh, background. The smaller one is alfalfa over there. Uh, but this is the kind of thing that waters um, three times an hour for about five minutes. Uh, so you could actually uh, go uh, away for the weekend, and the sprouts could still be uh, watering themselves. 
So seeds is really important if you're going to do this because this is seed intensive gardening, right? We're, we're mostly, we're eating them at the seedling stage. So we really got to have good seeds. And in fact, sprouting seeds are even higher on the scale of perfection than gardening seeds. You know how if you have a backyard garden, you go to the garden store, you get your seeds, and you get them in a little packet, and you take out the 30 or 20 seeds and you plant them. Uh, but you wouldn't go to the grocery store to get your seeds. You wouldn't go to the bulk bins to get them. You'd go to a special place that sells garden seeds. And unfortunately, the same thing is true with sprouting seeds. You really need to get them from a company that specializes in sprouting seeds. Because if you go to the bulk bins, you might have some success with some things. Lentils are almost always successful. And mung beans are almost always successful. And you could get those from the bulk bins. But when I talk about radish and broccoli and cabbage and kale, oh, you know, these are specialty seeds. And you want to get it from a company that's testing them and that's making sure that you've got the best seeds you can get. And it's hard work as someone who does this all the time. In fact, you, you can even see there's um, one of my stickers on the barrel here. That's to identify what I'm growing there because these are all part of my testing program. I have a big spreadsheet and I keep track of everything I test because I'm not going to put it in a package and sell it to you if I don't love it. And uh, agriculture uh, has uh, variations in it. Not every season is a winner. You know, the sunflower I got last season from the same, from, from a certain farmer in North Dakota. This year, it's not good at all. Last year, it was great. That's agriculture. So someone has to check. So uh, organic is really important. Um, I believe in organic. I've got a book called The Organic Food Guide. But uh, it's not enough because all this defines is how the farmer farmed. It doesn't tell us whether or not it's going to make great sprouts. Someone has to grow it and test it to find that out. So I want him to farm with organic principles, but that's not enough to get great sprouting seeds. And, and take a look at the difference here um, between uh, two organic wheats, all right? So this wheat over here, you can see, has lots of white mold in it. And I grew at the same time this wheat over here from another source, and look at it, it's perfectly clean. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of backstory to why this happens. I'll spare you uh, this because we don't really have the time, but the reality is somebody's got to test. Otherwise, you can go to the bulk bins in the health food store and get organic wheat, and the only thing I can promise you is that it'll make really good bread. Wheatgrass, that's another story. So garlic or onion chives looks like that. Wouldn't you like to have that in your salad? And alfalfa, you know, if you think of a head of lettuce like romaine lettuce, you're really eating these large leaves that are the result of a single seedling. But here, when you're eating the baby greens, you're eating hundreds of seedlings in your salad. And that gives you more nutrition just in itself. And you're eating them at the prime of the plant. So a sea of green is what you get. And there's broccoli on the right. And there's radish, all this stuff. Uh, you know, I sometimes put into my salad more ingredients than a lot of people put into salads in this country. I mean, if you think of the standard American salad, it's lettuce and tomato and maybe some shredded cabbage. Um, you know, it's not much more than that. But me, I've got 
salads where I can put in some broccoli and some kale and some radish and some chives and some alfalfa and some sunflowers. I mean, I've got in that salad so much, more than you really buy when you, when you shop at the produce stand. So I've got a wide selection of vegetables. And certainly, some of those vegetables are not that familiar to us, right? I mean, you all know about radish and cabbage and broccoli, but you never find alfalfa or clover or buckwheat at the produce stand. But if you were a cow or a horse, you would be very familiar with alfalfa and clover and buckwheat. And the reason that you don't see it at the produce stand is because these vegetables, when they start to mature, they get very fibrous. And it's just too chewy. All right? It's sort of like if you think about the, um, uh, the, the, the stalk of uh, broccoli, that's very chewy. Most people cook that and just eat the, or just eat the crowns. But the, uh, there's just too much fiber in the stalk. And it's similar if you were to grow alfalfa out to maturity where it's in the field or clover. Um, the uh, uh, pasture grazing animals, no problem. But we don't have those ruminant uh, stomachs to digest all that fiber. But as baby plants, the alfalfa, the buckwheat, the clover, absolutely succulent. And here is green peas on the left and green pea shoots on the right. Take a look at that. That could be in your salad every day of the week. It takes about 10 days to get to this point, all right? Sunflowers sprouted for two days on the left um, in a jumbled method like the sprout bag or a jar, but on the right, grown vertically, that's also about 10 days uh, as well. So that's the kind of thing I want to put in my salad, and especially in the middle of the winter. You have a choice. It's this, or we go out and we buy what's in the produce stand, which comes from the Salinas Valley in California, comes from Mexico, Central America. That's a long haul. And by the time it gets to your produce stand, it's probably a week old because, guess what? Um, it has a long journey, and it uh, goes through several hands, and uh, last week's produce has to get sold first as long as it's still in decent condition. So it stays in the refrigerator for an extra day or two, and then it comes out. And then do you show up the first day your produce manager brings out the new lettuce? Maybe. Maybe you shop on the weekend. Maybe it's already been out there for a couple of days. So things, um, things, things that are picked from the ground start a process of decay. So what that means is the plant is dying. So if the plant is dying, then you're not going to get all the vitamin A that you've been promised you're, because it's, you're getting less and less with each passing day. So if you want the nutrition that you deserve, it has to be fresh. And the only way you're going to get it fresh is when you buy local. And there's nothing more local than your kitchen. So the ultimate local agriculture. So let's talk a little bit about nutrition. I'm going to, go, um, I'm going to speed through some of this because I've got a lot of slides to show you, and I want to leave some time for you to ask questions as well. So... <clears throat> um, when I show you some of this nutrition research, I'm going to be skimming. So just bear, uh, bear with me. A lot of this is in my book, Sprouts the Miracle Food. Um, so you can find more resources there. So take a look at the alfalfa sprout versus head lettuce. That's protein. Now, lettuce is not a protein food. But when a non-protein food has four times the protein of other greens, that means that it also has to have high levels of vitamins, minerals, because you need those to produce protein. So take a look at a radish sprout versus the radish vegetable. The red line is the sprout. 
All right, so this first one is off the charts because um, uh, it's about 40 times more pro-vitamin A than the mature organic radish vegetable. So that's what I was telling you before about that multiplication factor. So we're eating a concentrated food, and remember I was saying that in order to get the therapeutic dosage, you need to get food the concentrated. And so sprouts are inherently naturally concentrated. Comparing you know, lentil sprouts and pea sprouts even to a wonderful vegetable like kale, you still get better. And uh, the, the tallest bars are radish sprouts and alfalfa sprouts. And the others are some of our finest vegetables, broccoli, cabbage. And uh, here is um, protein and fat. You know, I, was, I mentioned before about digestion and how important digestion is. Um, but the big issue is when, when you're eating, uh, like if we take a look at the chicken in the middle here, there's actually more fat. Fat is the red line. There's more fat than there is protein. So when uh, your body has to digest the chicken, it has to get through the, all of that fat. And then it has to dismantle the protein. It has to disassemble the protein because that protein was formed for a chicken's body. And we need a different arrangement of proteins. So we have to break the protein down. First we have to get through the fat, then we have to break the protein down, then we have to reassemble the proteins. And for our bodies, why not just start with plant protein, which is already broken down into its amino acids parts, assemble it yourself. If you were to work with lentil sprouts, look how much look fat is in lentil sprouts and soy sprouts, which makes soy oil, so it is very fatty, but it's still way less than something like eggs or chicken. And you know, even in milk, it's equal in terms of fat and protein. So the plant protein is really the best way to get your protein. And a lot of this information is in my book and uh, in my sprout chart. Um, so here's where I'm going to start to skim. But what I want to say is that we, we should be concerned um, our, 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 our discussion of nutrition should concern itself with more than the alphabetical vitamins. So it's, this is more than vitamin B and vitamin A and vitamin C. Now we're talking about plant compounds, phytochemicals that exist in these wonderful vegetables and baby vegetables that actually are therapeutic and actually can turn around cancer and, uh, and turn around disease and lower cholesterol. And those are things uh, like uh, phytosterols uh, and uh, polyphenols and bioflavonoids and antioxidants and glucosinolates and isoflavones. These are the phytochemicals that we want to get from our food. This is the healing factors in our food. And the science shows it. So if you look at this research is on sprouts, all right? So if you look at the research on diabetes and on cancer prevention and on the protective uh, role against uh, stress and DNA damage and a chemo preventive again, uh, breast cancer cells, I mean, this is all uh, sprouts here. And if we look at, uh, you know, a year later, again, uh, we're looking at lowering cholesterol, anti-inflammatory, ulcer prevention, um, uh, skin cancer, um, all with you know wheatgrass and uh, the uh, the brassica sprouts, which are kale and cabbage and broccoli, and um, detoxification, blood pressure, hypertension, again liver cancer prevention, a big problem. Um, so, uh, you know, this is real university research, and it goes on and, and on. And this is the kind of thing that if we eat a diet rich in these foods, we are preventing disease. And that's why this stuff is so important. So, and, and some of what they, they do 
um, is you know the phytoestrogens in these plants are an alternative to estrogen uh, therapy, um, which decreases uh, the uh, bad cholesterol, increases the good cholesterol. Are anti-carcinogenic, reduces um, the symptoms of menopause, increases bone density, prevents osteoporosis. Um, this is all coming from our food. This is where the best medicine is. And if you look at the sprouts, the soybean sprouts and the clover sprouts, big increase in soybeans, there's an increase of 4,200% from the, the bean to the sprout. So, and plants have saponins, saponins, uh, alfalfa sprouts, very high in saponins, clover very high in saponins. Saponins may sound like soap, to you, and actually, it has that detergent effect. Only the detergent effect is in our arteries. So when you have fats accumulating in the artery, causing blockages, you know that. Think of that like greasy dishes in your sink. You know, water is not going to do the job. You've got to use a detergent and then you cut right through that grease. Alfalfa sprouts, high in detergent, saponins. And that's why we have studies on alfalfa sprouts reducing uh, cholesterol. And again, 450% increase in the saponin content once you sprout it. That's why sprouting is the way to go. So a uh, study uh, done by... Uh, a cardiologist um, on lowering cholesterol. So, and we have more information. Uh, this is sprouted barley for cholesterol, Parkinson's disease. There's been limited research on fava bean sprouts, um, but we, we want to see more. Um, pancreatic cancer, uh, a, a lot of uh, research uh, there, mostly um, with um, uh, the brassica family. Um, broccoli sprouts, again, uh, a cancer, a major inducer of anti-carcinogenic protective enzymes from broccoli. We're protecting ourselves against cancer by eating broccoli sprouts. Bladder cancer, um, cardiovascular disease, uh, this, all this is university research this is real stuff here. Prostate cancer, skin cancer, and wheatgrass, as I mentioned earlier, the first green vegetable on the planet. But wheatgrass is real medicine. It's great stuff. It works because it cleanses the bloodstream. It uh, detoxifies the liver. It uh, purges the intestinal tract. Um, it, uh, it is a powerful growth hormone and blood purifier. I mean, if you start to purify your blood and detoxify your liver and clean your, uh, your intestinal tract, you're going to get better. And this is a powerful natural food that will go a long way in that direction. And look at the nutrition. And this comes from my book, Sprouts the Miracle Food, so you don't have to copy all of these numbers. Um, but how it compares against things like spinach and broccoli and eggs, really some of our finest foods. And um, it's a known anti-mutagen. And there is, uh, it's quite strong at a reasonably low level. Very powerful uh, stuff. Back in the 30s, some research was done on feeding animals. And you see the animals who, the gray bar is the animals who were on a diet of our best vegetables, you know, carrots and uh, uh, broccoli and uh, cabbage. And then the gray bar starts to go down because after nine weeks on that vegetable diet, they weren't getting everything they needed. So we, they added wheatgrass back into the diet, and three weeks later, 
it's all the way up. The black bars are just the animals, the guinea pigs, who ate wheatgrass all along. Their health continued to climb. So there's the evidence. But on we go for more evidence and university research on and on, cellular regeneration, prevention of arteriosclerosis, uh, anti-cancer for the prostate, pancreatic cancer. A lot is in my, uh, a lot of these, these research studies can be found in my book on wheatgrass. Uh, and also a lot of good information in Power Juice's super drinks. Now this is very interesting because how many of you have heard that uh, the um, the, the therapeutic agent in wheatgrass juice is chlorophyll. Have you heard that? Right. There was actually a quote from uh, Dr. Ann Wigmore. I don't know if it actually came from her lips or was just interpreted over the years, saying uh, that wheatgrass is 90% chlorophyll, and that's what makes it so potent. Right, because back to the photosynthesis and the origin of foods on the planet, sound, it sounds great. This wheatgrass product actually has, uh, is using wheatgrass and extracting the, the wheatgrass and putting it in the creams and in the sprays. Now, during that alcohol extraction process, the chlorophyll is removed, but the product still works. So we learned something else. And back in the 30s, they didn't know what it was. Uh, so they called it the unknown factor, the grass factor. But nowadays, we've identified it as a growth hormone. So one of the most potent aspects of wheatgrass medicine is the growth hormone. And that's why it repairs skin cells so well. And you can see this is a before and after uh, of eczema. And this is psoriasis. And um, the next picture is even worse, so you may not want to look at it. I'll go real fast. But it's leprosy, the worst skin disease of all, leprosy. And there is a before and after picture uh, that to see what this we applying the wheatgrass cream will do. And I'll just pause uh, to explain that a little bit because you're not going to want me to pause on the next picture because leprosy does not look good. But the, uh, the, the, the doctor who's behind this uh, started uh, using real wheatgrass on the skin with his patients. But it was a messy job. And a lot of his patients, the majority of his patients, couldn't get the fresh grass so easily. They, were, they had trouble growing it. Um, they you know, stained their clothing. Uh, it became hard. And so he extracted the uh, wheatgrass, just like you would extract echinacea or you would extract ginseng, uh, St. John's wort. He used it as an herbal extract, and he put that in these creams, and then it was easy to apply. So these creams represent that non-chlorophyll wheatgrass. So, okay, here's a, a quick run-through on this, on this next picture. So that is leprosy before and after. Uh, and you know, there's, some, there's healing, even with that horrible disease. And I have found that wheatgrass can even cure baldness, and I'm here to announce it tonight. Here you go. There you go. Oh, how I wish that worked. All right. So, but it, did, it does cure psoriasis, as I said before. And back uh, maybe 15 years ago when I was, went off of my game, um, I got psoriasis on my skin. And there's the proof of it. And you know what they say about psoriasis. They say that it's incurable. So if you go to um, any of these um, places over here, like uh, you know, the American Academy of Dermatology, there is no cure. You know, or... Um, uh, the alternative treatments have not been proven. There are side effects, and we, we use steroid medications and all that stuff. Well, I just didn't accept that. And I got back on track with my program, doing everything that I'm talking with, with you about today. And, um, and it's gone. 
And it was all over. What you saw on my, on my face <clears throat> was all over my body. So it was hard work. And maybe that's why they say there's no cure, because most Americans aren't going to put in the hard work. They're not going to put in the effort. And, uh, but it takes hard work to heal your, yourself. And if we don't put in the effort when we're well to maintain our health and to build our health, then how can you expect to beat disease when you're sick? So let's do the hard work now and prevent disease. Prevention is easier than treatment. So um, uh, just a, a, one of my raw food uh, menus, lots of things you can do. You know, raw soup, of course, the big sprout salads and tahini, basil dressing. This is in my cookbook. Hajiki, remember I said um, how the sea vegetables are so important. Uh, zucchini chips laid out in the dehydrator. Oh, there's all kinds of wonderful recipes. I'm sure you, you know of this. But of course, we, you know, we've got to spend more time in our kitchen. Your grandparents spent more time in their kitchen than you do. And I truly believe that one of the secrets to getting well is for us to spend more time in our kitchens working with food. And none of these fast shortcuts with prepared foods. We've got to go and make it from scratch. And the more we do that, that's an investment. It's an investment in our longevity and in the ability <clears throat> not just to live till the 80s or 90s, but to be able to walk through the gardens and smell the roses as opposed to being wheeled through the gardens in a chair. So... How do we want to end up? Let's put the investment in now. So we all want more energy. And that's, this is high energy food. So much energy, it makes you want to jump out of your skin. And that, it's not a Christmas tree. That is a single blade of wheatgrass. So that's the energy image that radiates from a living food. And this happens to be a very potent radiation because wheatgrass is a potent food. So, so that's what we want. We want to plug our bodies into that energy. That's what charges our batteries up. You all have cell phones. You plug your cell phone in every day. Let's plug our bodies in to, and recharge ourselves with the power of living foods. So, you know, I, I, we talk a lot about food, but, you know, we need to move that lymph around. The lymph is, is the waste products. Every cell in our body uh, uh, metabolizes. It eats its food and it spits out and excretes, and that goes into the lymphatic system, and it has to be... Um, uh, uh, disseminated, it has to be, it has to exit the body, otherwise it'll accumulate and reabsorb and that cause, causes all kinds of illness. So exercise is really important. Aerobic exercise of some kind every day is really, really important. And of course, we can't forget water because 67% of our body weight is fluid. And if you look at the, you know, the brain is, you know, 83% fluid and the muscles even the, the, is 75% and the, the, even bone is 22% fluid by weight. So it makes the difference between aching bones and aching joints um, could be the difference between just better hydration. You can hydrate with water. You can hydrate with juice but we don't hydrate with Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, you know, has a saying, Coca-Cola, the real thing. Nah. Wheatgrass is the real thing. <laughs> so, and this is also part of our responsibility now because you're learning a lot, but you have to pass this information along. And we need the next generation to start 
uh, eating this way. And kids love sprouts because it's finger food. And it really connects them to the gardening. They can watch it grow literally in front of their eyes. That's, that's a great connection, right? Because now if a kid goes into the supermarket and you buy, um, I don't know, you know uh, hamburger meat, um, it comes in a plastic package. So there's no connection to an animal or to anything. But when the food is growing in front of their eyes, that's a strong connection. And if we instill that in children at an early age, it lasts a lifetime. That's a real gift. So grow things in your home, whether it's in the backyard garden, if you've got the right season, whether it's in the kitchen garden with some of this. You know, let, let's influence them. It'll, it'll pay back. It'll pay you all back, your whole family back, many times. In, in, in my household, even my dog eats sprouts. The photos don't lie. This was not Photoshop. I, this is my disclaimer right now. That's it. Untreated photos. And, uh, and it does keep you young. This is me with uh, Ann Wigmore in 1979. I brought her my buckwheat sprouts. And this is when I first invented the sprout bag and uh, back in the old days. So... Um, Going on for a long time. Let's see. So, guess what? I still have time for your questions. Thank you very much for listening to my long-winded speech. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hope I haven't overwhelmed you all, but uh, let's, let's see what we uh, have. Question. So, uh, thanks. It was a great talk. Okay. And um, when you had psoriasis, you, you say you fell off the wagon or something for a little while, and you got off sprouts, and then you got psoriasis, and then you got back on it, and you cured it, and my question is, how long did it take you to cure it when she got it that bad? Well, it, it uh, took years. First of all, I, I, will, I will say this, that as a ch I got into this whole health trip because as a child I had allergies. So remember I mentioned that's an autoimmune disease, and um, all the autoimmune diseases are related so whether it's allergies or psoriasis, I had the foundation for both. I could have had the foundation for chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia, um, but my body manifested the symptoms that way. So I had allergies and asthma as a, a young person right up to age 25. And it's when I went through this big change in my diet that I was able to stop the allergy symptoms and the asthma. And... Um, um, and I, I, th that stopped, but then after, I don't know, maybe it was 15 years or so, and I got a little looser, I was feeling so good, I was so healthy, and I'm doing travel, when you're traveling, you know, you're, you're going, you're on the highway, and you're at airports, and you're, you're eating all kinds of things because you don't have the good options, and you're feeling good, and I just went off the wagon. So I, I never left vegetarianism, uh, but I wasn't, uh, eating the quality, uh, and I actually stopped going on the speaking circuit uh, for a while, because first of all, I didn't look like a very good representation of, uh, of the health programs that I knew so well, um, and uh, it took me years, it took me about five years to get off of it, and I just got to tell you that at some point uh, when I eliminated the source, the source of it is the immune system. And the immune system is really hard to retrain, to re-educate, um, to reprogram. Um, but even after I did that, the skin was still showing the symptoms. And uh, what I realized is that I also had to reprogram the skin. So that took a lot of extra effort and, and work. And it took about five years of hard work. And, I, and like I said before, now I know why they say it's incurable, because most people aren't going to put in that work. Um, but, you know, there's no magic potion that I used. I didn't even know about the wheatgrass creams at that time. At that time, I just did everything I'm talking to you about, the juicing, the sprouting, 
the going straight, when, you're, when, you are, when you have a condition that you need to cure, you've got to go 100%. You know, and, and that's what I had to do. So I had to tighten up on, uh, uh, on my personal practice. And now you can come up to me and you, you can stare. It's okay to stare. You know, but uh, I, I, let me be an example uh, for you. This stuff is real. Go ahead. Thank you. How you doing? Um, I have a pretty severe acid reflux, and I, I think I might have a hiatal hernia. And I've just noticed my um, digestion has been getting really, really poor, and I'm not sleeping well at night. Um, it's just constant reflux, and even um, I have a I have a pretty good diet, um, um, a pretty high vegetable, vegetarian diet, and mostly organic. And I, even I find with the green drinks, like green smoothies, I, I still get reflux. I mean, do you think uh, maybe going on a juice fast would help, or? I I do think a juice fast uh, will help. Um, w- one of the th- the things that that happens on uh, juice fast, I'm I'm starting a program with a group. Uh, right now, in fact, one of one of members of the group is is, is here. <laughs> Hi, Sue. <laughs> so, um, one of the wonderful things about it is that we get a chance to clean the uh, intestinal tract, and you know, the esophagus right up to the tongue is the top of the intestinal tract, and and your bottom is the bottom of the intestinal tract, and to be able to cleanse that whole tract and reduce the inflammation. That, that's essentially what the res, your response is. The reason why almost anything you, you, uh, you take gives you that reaction is because it's inflamed. It's irritated. So when you go on a, on a juice fast, which I recommend over water fasting, but if you go on a, on a fast, well, now you're not irritating the tissues. And, but the, and if you're t- taking the colon cleansers, uh, which basically just clean out the intestinal tract from top to bottom, uh, then you're giving, you're, you're cleaning it and you're giving it some time to heal. And you should be taking uh, some uh, herbals like L-glutamine uh, powder, um, slippery elm uh, powder um, along with it. There's a wonderful product called, uh, by Renew Life called Intestinu, uh, I believe. And that product has some of those ingredients in it. And that uh, L-glutamine helps heal the tissues of the intestinal tract. And the nice thing about it is these are fast-healing tissues. It's just the constant irritation. that it's, If you had a rash on your skin and you were doing some kind of business where it was constantly exposed uh, to, to being scraped, um, that rash would never go away. You can imagine that. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the same thing that's happening inside. But, you know, if you could protect this and put something healing and soothing on it and give it some time, give it a break, give it a rest, uh, then that tissue will heal. Same thing internally as well. Can you have enough uh, energy on a juice fast? I, I just don't understand. Can, can you get enough? Can you have enough energy in a juice fast? Well, actually, the, the energy that is required to achieve digestion with all the food that we stuff into ourselves every day, they say saps up 75% of our available energy. All right, It's work to digest all that food. I mean, you just came off of a holiday, right? Thanksgiving and Christmas, all those big meals. And how many of you have relatives that actually fell asleep at the dinner table? Am I right? So that's because you've sapped all your energy out of you. Well, on a juice fast... You don't have to use up that energy, so that energy is available. So you actually feel quite awake, and sometimes it's even hard to go to sleep. So um, it's a lot more energy, and not to mention the fact that with these concentrated juices, you're being better nourished than you can be from food. As I mentioned earlier, our livers are not op- operating at 100% efficiency, so, but when you're drinking the juice, you're getting close to 100%. So we're really getting much better nourished on a juice fast. So it takes, there's a transition of about three days there where, where your secretions are still going on and so you're feeling hungry. But, you know, you, put, you get your head into the right mindset and you stick to your motivation. You know why you're wanting to do this. If you want to do this because you're trying to, clear some, to cure something that's really annoying you, then you... Uh, you'll stick to it, and those first few days will be uh, will will pass successfully. Thank you. Can I answer this question? Um, I'm 
enjoyed your presentation. I'm not too familiar with uh, sprouting. Um, I assume you just eat them and don't juice them. They're too small for the juicer. And do you, right? You just eat them. And do you eat the little, you know how sometimes you buy them in a container in the supermarket? You don't eat the roots, right? You just kind of cut them off at some point. And, well, and can you tell us the difference between the different systems you have up there? Okay. Well, the, um, uh, some, some sprouts we do juice. Um, remember, uh, when you juice, it gets more concentrated. Well, if you start to juice something like radish, mm. well, wow, that's going to be a concentrated flavor. You know, it's a little bit like juicing garlic, right? If you juice garlic, oh, that's so intense. So, you know, um, uh, so I like to, to stick with more neutral flavors like alfalfa and like sunflower. And I just li limit it to, uh, to that. But then again, if I happen to have um, extra of uh, pea shoots, I'll put those in. I don't really love the flavor of juiced pea shoots, although I enjoy pea shoots in a salad. So it, it varies like that. And um, uh, I have a couple of systems here. One is vertical, and uh, this is a vertical system. This is a vertical system. And this is a jumbled system. Um, so this is more entry uh, level for uh, sprouting. Uh, and uh, this is uh, vertical, which means you can do the ones that turn green and leafy, uh, which is great. How you doing? My name is Phil Nicosistis. I'm Hippocrates Health Educator from West Palm Beach, Florida. And I want you to know, you'll be happy to know I ordered two of your bags on Amazon while you were talking. So I guess Wi-Fi is not so bad all the time. <laughs> Mike, Mike, I do actually, hopefully we have time to indulge me in two questions. Number one, what's the best way to, to uh, grow uh, mung bean shoots in large quantities at home? I know that p some people have a, like, a, like buckets with pressure on them and so on. Uh, I never really worked that out myself at home, and I'd love to know how to do that. Secondly, um, do you need to drink wheatgrass if somebody regularly implants wheatgrass? Okay, so... Um Let's do, the, let's do the second first because that's uh, uh, more, more important. Well, whether you drink it or implant it is going to depend a lot on what you're trying to accomplish. Just optimal health and wellness. Yeah. Well, um, uh, for, optimal, for, for just optimal health, drinking is sufficient. But if you're trying to cure cancer or something, you really got to get the higher volumes that you can only get by implantation. Because most people can't stomach more than maybe four ounces. There are some really tough guys out there who can do more than, than that. Uh, but it, it can disturb the stomach. So the rectal implants are a way to get the higher volumes in. And um, uh, some of the people with uh, uh, the survivors uh, who used wheatgrass uh, against, in their fight against cancer uh, were taking in as much as a quart of wheatgrass juice a day, but that was mostly uh, rectally. Mm -hmm. okay. Loretta Venus knows an awful lot about this. Am I right, Loretta? About, about 32 ounces of wheatgrass is not too much no. if you're sick. Uh, there was a lady who did wheatgrass implants for six months. It was about 32 ounces every single day. But her esophagus was full of uh, tumors, so she couldn't swallow anything. But she healed, and she was alive for 30 years. It was amazing. I have a question about gluten. But did, I, uh, did I miss out? Oh, yes, the mung beans, the mung beans, Phil. The, the mung beans, um, you know, uh, uh, it's amazing how much weight you could put on top of these sprouts, including mung beans, including uh, sunfl sunflowers. You've got some great pictures of of stones and rocks on it. It's amazing how strong 80, they... 80 pounds. 80, 80 pounds of uh, weights on sunflower sprouts. I have a DVD at my booth, and it's amazing. I mean, it can lift it and knock it off. Yeah. I have come into the room and found my sprouts on the floor. <laughs> but, but that's going to make them thicker and uh, juicier. Yeah. And that's, yeah, and that's what the, the Asians, uh, professional sprouters do. Um, they, uh, uh, they get them really nice and thick like that. 
Well, this is Loretta Vanius. She uh, is a health educator, longtime sprouter and friend. Hello. Hi, Steve. Thank you very much. I really yeah. enjoyed your lecture. I have a question about gluten. There is a new book that was written, Grain Brain. And in the book, he says on, chapter, on page 68 and 69, lists wheatgrass as having gluten. The, what's the name of the book? Grain Brain. Oh, 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 Grain Brain. Grain Brain. Yes. And he lists wheatgrass. Now, the question is, I mean, the wheatgrass that is six inches and we juice, that doesn't have any gluten. No. You know, even authors can make mistakes. Okay. Uh, another question. At what point is the grain, like I make a sprouted rye and spelt bread, and when I sprout this grain, it sprouted almost triple the size of the grain. Is there gluten there? At what point is gluten broken down into amino acids that the body can utilize and not be a gluten anymore? Well, what, what Loretta is, is describing is um, how do you get, um, is this process where we're starting out with a glutinous grain, whether it be wheat or barley, um, and as the grain grows into a green plant, it's actually going through a transformation, transformation from a grain to a vegetable, to a green vegetable. When it's at the green vegetable stage, it's a complete transformation. It's a green plant. There is no gluten in green plants. And with every day of growth, of maturity, the, the, the gluten, which is made up of gliardin and gluatinin, um, starts to break apart and to break down because of the sprouting process. And uh, I, I, at what point is it totally 100% corn? Well, uh, I think you have to get to the point where the blade is actually started to green up and the blade is maybe an inch to two inches. And, but with each passing day, there is less and less gluten. So in some of the pictures I, I showed on my bread, and like you were describing on your bread, um, I was growing, um, growing it to a very short stub, which is just a, the, the shoot is just about as long as the, the length of the grain itself. You're growing it three or four times longer it, than it's, that. It's about that, but it's, oh, it's about that. It, you know, it, it starts depending if I was around. When it, you know what I'm saying? It gets very chewy if it grows longer. But, but what I do is I dehydrate it, and then I grind it up into flour. Ah. So is it gluten-free, or is there gluten in that? There, there's still a level of gluten, gluten in it. So if you're super sensitive to gluten there's going to be some there. If you, if you only have a minor sensitivity, then you probably will be able to tolerate a sprout that's maybe three days old. Mm -hmm. But um, with each passing day, there's less and less gluten because the transformation continues and gets less and less. And it's unfortunate. There's a, there's a lot of things um, that are published that have inaccuracies in it. I mean, you know, there's, there's studies, there's university studies out there uh, that says, you know, uh, taking uh, calcium in your diet does nothing uh, for, your, for the health of your bones. And there's studies out there that say uh, supplement yourself with calcium every day. It'll uh, reduce osteoporosis. So if the scientists can't agree, you know, how can we come to a conclusion? And uh, that's just the, you know, we have to be good detectives and do our own uh, work. I'll never forget when Andrew Weil, uh, the wise doctor uh, who's done wonderful things for the promotion of natural health, came out and said, don't eat alfalfa sprouts, you know, because they've got uh, a carnivarnine in there and it's a poison. Well, you know, I read that study and I think he just read the summary because there was a lot more to it than that. I mean, they actually fed the monkeys carnivarnine, and uh, the sprouts that they fed the monkeys were uh, only like one or two days growth. It was like petri dish sprouts. And in order for the carnivarnine, the poison, 
to dissipate, you have to grow the sprouts to the green stage. So I don't know about you, but when I eat off alpha sprouts, it's green. Yes. And at that point, no carnivarnine. So essentially, you know, the good doctor is stating a case of something that may have, under certain circumstances, accuracy, but is essentially has no significance in human nutrition. Can a plant, can a wheatgrass that grows to the point of having seed, is that called the wheatgrass? That's, that was the question that maybe he thought when the, when the grain grows into a plant and it produces the seed, is that considered wheatgrass? Well, when, uh, I think when the blade comes out, it's considered wheatgrass. But when it gets to the point where it's, it's producing the next generation, um, that's going to have gluten in it. Right. But it, would it be called the wheatgrass? Well, I think it's... That, that's the question. You I know, think like the grass is called wheatgrass. At, regardless of what stage. Yeah. So maybe that's where he thought it might have the gluten then. Maybe. We'll have to have that conversation one <laughs> okay. day. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi. My question was also about the gluten because I make uh, rejuvelac and I sprout the wheat berries for about three days and then, you know, or actually, yeah, you soak them and then you fill up the jar with the water and then it ferments for like three days, four days. Um, my friends are gluten intolerant and I've told them that it's fine, but I, I don't they won't drink it. Is it the same? Okay, so the question is, um, is what's your name? Rejuvelac. I'm Cheryl. Cheryl makes Rejuvelac. Rejuvelac is actually a fermented drink. So if you think, think pickles, think sauerkraut, we can make fermented drinks from a lot of things. This drink is made from wheat sprouts, sprouted wheat. Is it soft wheat or hard wheat, Cheryl? It's the red winter... It's red wind, so it's hard wheat. Okay, so um, there's going to be gluten uh, in there. Most of it will deposit uh, like sediment to the bottom. Um, you could strain it. Um, if, you're weak, if you're gluten intolerant, um, then even a small amount is going to be, uh, okay. co could cause a reaction. Uh, you could try making it with some other grains. You could try making it with millet. You could try, you know, my recipe book, Kitchen Garden Cookbook has a chapter on rejuvelac. Okay. And in there, I make it with some alternative grains. Okay. I mean, you know, and you could turn it into cabbage rejuvelac as okay. well, essentially. That's juice made from fermenting the cabbage. So, and that would be totally gluten-free. So there are some, you have alternatives. Thank but the, the, the weed is going to produce some gluten. Okay, thank you. Oh, this gentleman was, I've got to go back and forth. Go ahead. Hi, uh, kapucha tea. Uh, do you recommend doing the juice fast with kombucha tea? Well, uh, kombucha is another fermented drink, so it's loaded with probiotics, friendly bacteria, which was, which is an uh, absolute necessity, and that um, uh, is good. It's absolutely great. A little bit like rejuvelac in that uh, you have to acquire a taste for it, and not everybody is going to love it. But then again, not everybody loves wheatgrass juice. Not everybody loves cilantro. My main uh, question is about this new this fast that you're doing, a program. Can you yeah. just briefly explain what you're doing another day with a bunch of people? Oh, sure, sure. Well, um, uh, a few times a year, I, uh, I, we get together as a group. We're, we're getting together online. Um, and we go through a program. Uh, it's, it, it encompasses... Ten days of time we meet before we start to fast to discuss the fasting, uh, how to fast and how to get organized. Uh, and then we meet during and uh, before the end of it. And uh, there's a, uh, a daily diet, there's a timeline, there's a shopping list. Uh, but basically the program is juices. It's primarily vegetable juice, green vegetable juice. Uh, and in addition... Um, well, it would be, uh, you know, uh, spinach, kale, um, uh, then um, parsley, celery um, are, are the main ones, uh, cucumber, um, garlic, or ginger, uh, not both at the same time. Um, then there is, um, so that's, that's the juice. We're drinking about a gallon of fluids a day, maybe a quart of water, a quart of green juice, uh, a liver cleanser every day, um, maybe um, half a quart 
of uh, sweet juices. Sweet juices could be carrot juice. You know, carrot and beets. Um, beet is, uh, you know, one of the world's major sources of, uh, of sugar. So uh, very sweet. So we, we try to minimize that to a, about uh, half a quart. But the, uh, the liver cleanser, which is a grapefruit lemon uh, drink, that's about half a quart. Uh, all together, if you can get a gallon of fluids into your system, you're flushing your system uh, really well. At the same time, we do a certain amount of exercise uh, to oxygenate the system and to move the lymphatics ar around and the blood circulating. Uh, and it's amazing what you can accomplish in a, in a week's time of cleansing. You know, we're also focused here on food, but I've got to say uh, to you that the way the body was designed, uh, it emphasizes detoxification. Because the lymphatic system, which if you think of the, you know, the circulatory system as, um, as track, uh, right, all these tubes and veins and arteries, all that track length, well, and, and there's a heart that pumps uh, through that track. The, the lymphatic system is approximately four times bigger than the circulatory system. And the lymphatic system is in charge of disposing waste. So, and there's no pump. The only pump is our movement, our exercise. So we've got to follow the body's design and spend more time detoxifying, exercising, um, flushing out, sweating. That's how, if we do that, we spend more focus on, on eliminating poisons. Uh, we'll need to eat less and nourishment will be uh, more um, efficient. That says, oh, the time is up. I got, how about this one last quickie question? Go ahead. Well, uh, can I recommend companies that are reliable for ordering sprout seed? Well, of course, uh, not to toot my own horn, but I have one of the largest uh, companies for sprout, organic sprouting seeds that I test personally. And if you visit my website, sproutman.com, there's about 36 different flavors uh, there, and you can look at that. Um, my uh, competitors uh, out there, um, there's a handful of them, some of them I'm very friendly with. Uh, Mum's Sprouting Seed, they're based in Canada, wonderful people. They have sprouting.com. So I have sproutman.com, they have sprouting.com. And I love those people. Um, there's, um, there's other people out there, but what's really important is that we test the sprouting seeds for E. coli and salmonella. I won't buy any seed anymore unless I've got those lab reports. Um, and I, you know, I don't do them. I buy them from people who do them. And you know, they go through and they, they poke every single bag and they grow out those sprouts. And they put them all together and then they blend them up and then they test that liquid. They test the rinse water and we get lab reports on this. Molds, yeasts, um, pathogenic bacteria, E. coli, listeria, um, salmonella, uh, you know, because that's contamination. Sprouting seeds don't originate these, these toxins. Um, uh, spinach doesn't. Uh, tomatoes don't. It comes from the intestines of animals, but it can be contaminated. And so we have to check. That's just the, the, the food safety climate we live in today. Very important. So thank you all for listening. I'll be out back more.